Hey there, I'm Stefan Kesting, and this is the Strenuous Life Podcast. Yes, you're absolutely still at the right place. Welcome to the very first edition of the Strenuous Life Podcast, which is the rebranding of the Grapple Arts Radio Podcast. Now, there's a quote from Teddy Roosevelt that I'd like to start with. It goes, I wish to preach not the doctrine of ignoble ease, but the doctrine of the strenuous life, the life of toil and effort, of labor and strife, to preach that highest form of success which comes not to the man who desires mere easy peace, but to the man who does not shrink from danger, from hardship, or from bitter toil, and who out of these wins the splendid ultimate triumph. So, Teddy Roosevelt was a flawed and imperfect human being who became the President of the United States, but he did practice what he preached. He rode, he went to war, he led from the front, he wrestled, he did judo. In fact, he even lost vision in one eye while boxing while president in the White House. So he did live the strenuous life. He didn't just preach it. And obviously, that's where the name for this next phase of my podcast comes from. Now, the original vision I had for Grapple Arts Radio was to find and talk to some of the most interesting people in jiu-jitsu, in mixed martial arts, and in martial arts in general. And yes, I'm still going to be talking jiu-jitsu. I'm still going to be talking MMA. And I'm still going to be talking to martial arts people. That isn't going to change. But I'm going to be doing more as well. I'm going to be using this podcast to look for and talk with and pick the brains of people who embody some aspect of the strenuous life. People who are doers, not complainers. People who are actually in the arena. People who are pushing themselves to the limit in some field. Now, of course, a lot of these will be martial artists, fighters, competitors, and coaches. That is my world, after all. And I want to keep including that. But just like you can learn from people doing other styles of martial arts, you can also learn from people pushing themselves and challenging themselves in different areas. And that's why... For this very first episode of the rebrand of the Strenuous Life podcast, I've come here, which is a lower peak in the Swiss Alps, where I'm currently three days into a hike in the mountains. And I'm sitting here, and I'm looking at three giant mountains that are side by side, the Eiger, the Monch, and the Jungfrau. And I want to talk to you about two audacious and bold and brave climbing attempts both of which ended in disaster. Now, where I'm sitting right here doesn't look all that strenuous or dangerous. I'm sitting on a rock. There are flowers all around. You can see waterfalls. You can actually see cows in the distance, and you can hear the clanging of their bells. And it's pretty idyllic. And like I said, there are these three mountains, and it's the first of these three mountains that's the most famous. It's the Eiger. And it's the north face of the Eiger that I'm staring at right now. This north face faces north, it's hardly ever in the sun, and it's this big, dark, tall, imposing wall of rotten limestone and snow and some ice, and it's more than 1,800 meters tall, more than 60 people have died climbing it, or trying to climb it, and there are rock falls and freezing water, and it's really dangerous. It's more than a mile straight up, and even from where I'm sitting here, It looks incredibly impressive, but I can't sit here and not think about the famous expedition in 1936 where four men, Andreas Hinterstreusser, Tony Kurtz, Willi Angerer, and Eddie Rayner tried to climb this face. It was considered the last great unsolved problem in the Alps. And there was a competition between the climbers of the time to find a way up this face. So these four set out, and it would have been, if they had succeeded, a first ascent that had never been climbed before. Just the previous year, two other climbers had tried it and failed and died. So these four climbers set out. They started as two separate teams, but then they joined forces and they climbed and they climbed. And then they came to one of the most famous 
parts of the climb, there is this traverse that you have to do. You have to cross this sheer wall of rock and go from the right side to the left side, but there are virtually no handholds. So the way they did it is they actually climbed higher than where they needed to go, and then they attached a rope to a piton in the rock, and then one of, of the men, Andreas Hinterstoiser, pendulumed across. He went back down the rope, and using the rope, he worked his way, swung his way across the other side. And once he was across, they could get a horizontal rope across the problem section, and the rest of them could cross. And even now, 81 years afterwards, that section of the climb is still known as the Hinterstoiser Traverse. Unfortunately for them, the climbing after this really difficult part just got harder and the conditions also got worse. So they climbed higher and then they spent a night in a bivouac hoping to get to the top the next day. Now, bivouac here, under these kinds of conditions and with the technology of the day, doesn't mean you know, a cozy tent on a portal ledge and a warm sleeping bag. It basically means sitting on a rock ledge wrapped in a canvas sheet and praying for dawn, you know, hoping to, hoping that dawn comes before you freeze to death and that you still have all your fingers in the morning. The next day came and they continued up. But at some point during that day, they ran into one of the other biggest problems of the Eiger beyond just the height and the difficulty of the climbing. And that's the rock fall. This slope is continuously shedding rocks and boulders, and because it's a vertical wall, they fall straight down. So as they were climbing, one of the team members, Willi Angerer, was hit by one of these rocks in the shoulder and was heavily injured. So now they ended up having to spend a second night on, out on the mountain, basically camping out in another bivouac situation, and in the morning, on the third day, they decided to retreat, taking Willi down with them. So they were going to basically rope him down, then climb down, then rope him down, then climb down. As if climbing this wasn't difficult enough with four able-bodied people, they were now climbing with three able-bodied people and one person who was disabled. So the weather now got cold and wet and terrible, but that wasn't the worst part of it. When they came back down to the traverse, that really difficult portion that they had to swing across, they had taken the ropes that they had set there with them. They didn't know if they were going to need those ropes higher up. So they took that rope and that horizontal rope was no longer there. In retrospect, it was a terrible mistake. So now they had no way across to go back to safety. They tried the same move as before. They tried to pendulum across. Before they had gone from right to left, but now they're going in the opposite direction from left to right. Maybe it was because going left to right in that condition and that particular wall is a lot more difficult than going the other way. Maybe it was because it was now their third day of climbing, two days of which had been in bad conditions and they were exhausted. Maybe it was the wet rock. Maybe there was new ice on that rock. We don't know, but they couldn't make it back across. They could not cross back across the Hinterstoiser Traverse. They did have a backup plan because going up the inside of this Eiger mountain is a railway. They built a railway tunnel that goes up through the inside of this mountain, going up to close to the peak. And it was this tourist railway. So as they were digging this railway, as they were excavating this railway years prior to this, there were little holes put into the side of the Eiger, where they would throw out the rock, where they would throw out the mining debris, and also a couple places where you could go out to a ledge and look out, and the railroad, as it goes up, the railway train would stop, and people get out and have a look. There are these small tunnel holes scattered throughout the mountain. So what they decided to do when they couldn't make it across the traverse is continue on down. They tried to go down by a more dangerous route, but get to one of these small holes in the face that connected to the railway tunnel. And they almost made it. They came really close. On the last stretch, the very last rappel before getting to safety, they got a full-on avalanche, which killed three out of the four men almost instantly. The avalanche knocked Hinterstoiser, he of the Traverse, off the mountain. He was dead instantly. It fractured Angerer's skull, 
As he fell against the cliff, he was attached to the rope, fell down, and it asphyxiated Rainier by pulling the rope around his chest so tightly that he couldn't breathe. So this left one of the four men alive, Tony Kurtz. He's injured, but still alive. He's dangling from a rope connected to two of his dead climbing partners. He's frostbitten. He's hypothermic. He's in an almost impossible situation, but he's still alive. Down below, the various little hotels and the various little inns and the various little cafes, even now, they have, they have these giant telescopes where you can look up and you can see the climbers. And they had those back in 1936 as well. So the people down below got a sense that there was a problem. You know, Houston, we have a problem. Iger Base Camp, we have a problem. So three Swiss guides came up through the railway tunnel that evening. And even though there were treacherous avalanche conditions on the face, they climbed out through the railway hole and they tried to rescue Tony Kurtz the last survivor of this climbing expedition. But it was late in the day, the weather conditions were terrible, and they had to retreat. So now they left Tony Kurtz for a third night on the mountain. Except this time, he's not even in the comfort, and I'm putting quotation marks around the word comfort. He wasn't even in the comfort of a bivouac. He was dangling on the mountain, not far from two of his dead companions. It's about the worst bivouac situation you can imagine. But somehow, he managed to survive this third night. So somehow, he not only survives the night. I can only imagine, on a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being the most miserable night you've ever had, this is about a 20. He managed to survive the night. He cut loose the guy who was hanging beneath him, the dead body of Vili Anger, who was hanging beneath him. And he managed to climb back up to the ledge above, despite having one arm and one hand completely frozen. So the next morning, the fourth day, the rescuers came back, but they couldn't reach him. They couldn't climb up the last overhang to him. So instead, they got him a rope, and they they managed to pass a rope up to him. It was two 30-foot sections of rope connected with a knot, and all he needed to do was to rappel down to them. Now, keep in mind that this is his fourth day on the mountain. He's been in an avalanche. He spent three nights in absolutely horrendous conditions on the mountain. He's exhausted. He's injured. He's hypothermic. And one arm is completely frozen solid and not working at all. And still, somehow he managed to set up the rope, set up the rappel, and start coming down. And things were looking good. He was almost within reach of the rescuers, who almost certainly could have grabbed him, gotten him back to the tunnel, and to safety. But remember that knot I mentioned, the one holding the two sections of rope together? Well, that knot got caught in his rappelling gear, and he couldn't go any further. To a climber in normal conditions, to somebody with two functioning hands, passing a knot is no big deal at all. It's bread and butter. But when you're there, you're exhausted, you're hypothermic, you only have one arm, it's really difficult. It's an elementary maneuver that he needed to do. All he needed to do was climb up a little bit, put a tiny bit of slack into the rope, and let the knot pass through the hardware. On a good day, he probably could have done this blindfolded. But there he is, 15 feet above the rescuers, had no way of getting him down. It was too much. He was too weak. He was too far gone. He was too cold, numb, and exhausted to do it. And so, when he was almost at safety, almost back to the tunnel that would have led him down the hill to where he could have warmed up, maybe lost an arm, but at least saved his life, he died. And there's a black and white photo of him dangling there, just above the reach of his rescuers, just out of reach, just so close, and it's heartbreaking. This is one of the classic mountain tragedies that every alpinist knows, and it makes sense. The name Eiger comes from the German word for ogre, which is a monster, and in German, the north face is called the Nordwand, but it's also sometimes called the Mordwand, with an M instead of an N that translates to murder wall. Like I said, more than 60 people have died 
on this one climb, this one face. But eventually, it was conquered. It hasn't killed everybody who's tried to climb it. In fact, the first successful ascent came a couple years later, in 1938, and it is now one of the great routes of the Alps. Many of the alpinists, the who's who of alpinists, have done it. And some say that although they've done harder routes somewhere else, they haven't done scarier routes. And maybe it's the story of Tony Kirk's dangling there on his rope and the whole 1936 Iger disaster that they've got in the back of their minds. Anyway, nowadays it often takes teams a couple of days, two, three days to climb it. But not everybody. Some people do it faster, way, way faster. And it was about five years ago that I was watching a video of somebody speed climbing this wall. And that's really the second part of the story and part of the inspiration for me coming here to Switzerland and sitting here under these magnificent mountains. So about five years ago, I was watching a video of somebody speed climbing this particular route. And that man's name was Uli Steck. Uli was a Swiss alpinist. He was a small guy. He was a carpenter who lived in Interlaken. So Interlaken is basically in the shadow of the Eiger. It's kind of the adrenaline sport central of Switzerland. And he's much more famous in Europe, where alpinism and climbing is a really big deal than he is here in North America. But he should be better known, because the things he pulled off was amazing. One of his really big first achievements was climbing the Eiger, then coming down, climbing the Monk, then coming down, and climbing the Jungfrau, which are three gigantic mountains side by side, back to back in 25 hours. That's a long time to be on the road, (laughs) even if you're just hiking. It's hard enough to continue hiking for 25 hours. I've done it. It's really hard. By the end of it, you're dead tired. Now, instead of hiking on relatively level terrain, try climbing straight up, straight up, for miles and miles with the chance of rock and ice and avalanche and wet spray and a million other disasters that could happen. Try doing that for 25 hours solid. That was an amazing achievement. But then a couple of years later, he tore up the north face of the Eiger by the same route that that 1936 doomed expedition tried. So it was 1,800 meters of rock, ice, and snow and finished it in 3 hours and 54 minutes, which set a new world record. So the early ascents of the Eiger took 3 or 4 days, and here he is doing it in just under 4 hours, which is incredibly impressive, but he thought he could do better. So he went and did a whole bunch of specific training. He doubled down on his conditioning. He went and talked to some of the very best sports scientists in Switzerland, and trained and trained and trained, and in a year later, he went back and absolutely smashed his old record. Now he did it in two hours and 47 minutes. So in most sports, a new world record is set by a difference of seconds or even milliseconds, and here he is taking more than an hour off of his previous time. That's unprecedented. And it was a documentary video of the second climb that I watched. And it's how I became aware of him because it's so spectacular. He's free climbing up the north face of the Eiger. So there are no ropes. He's got a rope around him. I think it was for an emergency situation. Maybe it was for just one section. But by and large, he's free climbing the entire thing with crampons and with ice axes. And he's hanging there off the rocks by the tip of his ice axes with nothing but a thousand meters of air beneath him. There are no ropes. If he slips, if he falls, if he gets hit by a rock, he dies. Zero margin for error. And that wasn't even his last time setting a record on this mountain, which was his home mountain. Another climber, another Swiss climber, ended up doing the same route in two hours and 28 minutes. And then Uli Steck went back and did it in two hours and 22 minutes to grab back his crown. And that's just his adventures and his challenges in Switzerland. He climbed Everest without oxygen. He free soloed Annapurna, which is an incredibly difficult climb. Then he went and did all 4,000 meter peaks in Western Europe, of which there are 82. 
in just 62 days. For that last challenge, he's doing multiple mountains in a day, day after day without stopping. And oh, just to make it more challenging, he didn't use a car. He ran, he hiked, or he biked from mountain to mountain. I think one time he even took a hang glider, a paraglider, down from one mountain, the top of one mountain, down to the base of the other. So it was all human-powered. That was more than a 1,000 kilometers of cycling in those 62 days, in addition to actually climbing the mountains themselves. No planes, no trains, no automobiles. Just insane levels of human endurance. So clearly, this was no normal human being. Uli Steck was someone who had amazing physical gifts, crazy levels of determination, quite honestly, a Swiss obsession with detail and precision. But those things only go so far. You don't get up a vertical wall a mile high of some of the most dangerous rock in the world in two hours and 22 minutes just by being tough. No, it takes thousands and thousands of hours of training and conditioning and perfecting your craft. If you even have a hope of doing something like that, And so to get ready for these climbs, he did do a massive amount of training. It wasn't spontaneous. Hey, I feel like climbing today, dude. Do you want to go climbing? No, it was really meticulously laid out. Just to put things into perspective for you, he once told an interviewer that most professional runners only train 900 hours a year, and I train 1,200 hours a year. That's a lot of mileage. Like I said earlier, He worked with some of the best sports scientists and trainers in Switzerland, and he trained like a maniac. And interestingly, it meant that he was doing a ton of cardio. It meant doing up to five days a week of uphill running, which was the mainstay of his cardio and actually translates pretty well to climbing. Then there was core training, and then there was stretching, and then there was mental training, and of course, then there's climbing, both in the gym and on the mountains. Now, Apparently, he was pretty secretive about his actual training regimen, but there are some indications, there are some records of what he did. And it looks like he spent at least as much time running as he did climbing. Now, of course, climbing would improve your cardio too. But when you're climbing, you're also limited by other things like muscular strength, endurance, and overuse injuries. You're not going to be able to redline your heart and your lungs for hour after hour after hour. And so he ran. He did a ton of running. And that corresponds very well with what I always say, that of all the physical attributes that you have, all of them are dependent on your endurance. If you get tired, then you're not strong. If you get tired, then you're not coordinated. If you get tired, you're not even smart. And of course, to be climbing three peaks in 25 hours, to be racing up the Eiger in two hours and 22 minutes, to be climbing Annapurna, to be on top of Everest without any oxygen, Your endurance just needs to be incomparable. It needs to be at the very, very elite level of fitness so that you have at least basic coordination, at least basic strength left to you. Most people, you put them on top of Everest, they're not going to be able to breathe. There's one third the amount of oxygen up there as there is at sea level. So if you, if you're a fairly healthy individual and you can do jujitsu, Now try to imagine doing jiu-jitsu, breathing only one-third as much air as you can normally breathe. You're going to get exhausted super quickly. Imagine how good a shape you would need to be in to still be able to perform whatever sport it is, whatever difficult physical activity it is that you enjoy doing on one-third the amount of oxygen that you're normally used to. And it was this training, this carefully laid out, carefully monitored approach to training that allowed him to pull off some of the most amazing feats in climbing. Where I'm sitting right now, I can see the Eiger, the Monk, and the Jungfrau. It's a trio of mountains that sort of define the Berner Oberland and define the Interlaken area. And for many people, they are the iconic mountains of Switzerland. These were in Uli Steck's backyard, and he climbed them many times. They were his home mountains. But there's another trio of mountains halfway around the world where this story ends. Those three mountains are Nupce, Everest, and Lotse. And yes, it's that Everest, the tallest mountain in the world. These three mountains are in a row. They're different peaks on the same gigantic ridge of rock, with Everest, the tallest, being in the middle. Now, 
Uli Steck had a history with Everest. He'd previously climbed it without oxygen, and unlike 95% of climbers who use oxygen for Everest and would probably die without it, he considered it for himself to be cheating. So he didn't use it. And like I said before, it was his amazing conditioning regimen that allowed him to pull it off. Another time, he tried to climb Everest and had to turn around just 45 minutes short of the summit. Imagine going all that way, doing all that preparatory work, and quite honestly, paying all that money to have to turn back so close to the summit. Another time on Everest, he'd been involved in the infamous Everest brawl, where a bunch of climbers and Sherpas got into it at an extreme elevation. Basically, one of Uli Steck's climbing partners had offended some Sherpas who were fixing ropes on a route to the summit. And there was a brawl at, Ever at the Camp 2 on Everest that made headlines around the world. And it's lucky that nobody was killed. Afterwards, he said that he might be done with Everest, but it wasn't true, or at least it didn't stay true. Because earlier this year, in 2017, Uli Steck went back to Nepal with a stated purpose of climbing Everest and then, without coming back to base camp and staying above 8,000 meters all the time, going to Lhotse, which is the fourth highest mountain in the world. So essentially, it's a traverse from the tallest mountain in the world, going down on the ridge and staying at, basically in the death zone and carrying on to the fourth highest mountain in the world. And just in case that wasn't difficult enough, the plan was to not take the normal route on Everest and take the West Ridge and the Hornbein Kulwar instead. Now, this is considered to be one of the most dangerous routes up the mountain. You're climbing up a narrow Kulwar, which is a super steep gully, and oh yeah, no oxygen. And this is the part that gets me. Although not everybody who's tried to climb it has died, there have been more fatalities than successful summiting attempts up this route. So the fatality to success ratio is more than 100%. Those are not good odds. If you're making an attempt on Everest by any route, you don't just go to base camp and head up. You're going to be operating at the limits of human endurance and the continuous risk of altitude sickness, and you have to acclimatize. So, like I said before, if you're going without oxygen, which only a tiny minority of the climbers have ever done, then you're going to be doing all that insane climbing with only one-third the amount of oxygen that you would have at sea level. So you have to acclimatize, which means staying at base camp, which is just over 5,000 meters up, and doing day climbs, right? Doing little expeditions, hikes, climbs, to give your body a chance to get used to that elevation. And that's exactly what Uli Steck did. He was going on climbs, and his climbing partner ended up getting frostbite and was recovering from frostbite. So he went off by himself to climb on Nupse, which is the least tall of those three mountains, Nupse, Everest, and Lhotse. All we know is that he fell. All we know is that he fell more than a thousand meters and died. Did he slip? Did his equipment fail? Did his ice axe come loose from a little crack? Did a slab of ice tear away? Did a rock come down and knock him off the wall? We will never know. He was climbing, he fell, he died, and that's what we know. His body was recovered by helicopter, and he was cremated in the Temboche monastery with his wife present a few days later. Now, climbing in the mountains, especially at that elevation, is an inherently dangerous activity. There's just no way around it. And as a mountaineer, as somebody who had been immersed in that culture for 23 years, as somebody who had rescued other people off the mountain, watched people die, as someone who had found long-lost bodies of other mountaineers lost in the mountain, Uli Steck knew the risks. He had to have accepted the risks. There's no way to be absolutely safe. Every ascent, especially in the Himalayas, at elevation, is a gamble. He rolled the dice. And this time, the best mountaineer in the world lost. To climb at that level, in those conditions, you need conditioning, you need experience, you need technique and equipment, but you also need luck. And on that day, 
his luck failed him. At least, unlike Tony Kurtz dying on the Iger in 1936, at least this ending was mercifully swift by comparison. And that is a mercy. So I'll leave you with one final tantalizing, unprovable speculation by Reinhold Messner. Now, Reinhold Messner is the godfather of modern alpinism. He was the first man to climb Everest without oxygen. He was the first man to climb all of the 8,000 meter peaks in the world. He had so many epic climbing adventures that we could have an entire episode just about him. And when he was asked about Uli Steck's death, he said one thing that resonated with me. He said, and I quote, It's not entirely clear to me why he, Uli Steck, took sight of Nupse in the first place. He had previously announced he was going to attempt a route from Everest to Lotse, for which he could have acclimatized on Everest. The only explanation I can think of is that he was looking to attempt the so-called horseshoe, summiting Nupse, Lotse, and Everest in the same tour. It's a route that poses a significant mountaineering challenge. Many alpinists have dreamed of accomplishing it. The horseshoe is extremely difficult. So far, nobody has done it. But if anybody was capable of doing it, it would have been Uli Steck. End quote. Just like the circumstances of his death, we'll probably never know what his intentions were. Was he really thinking about or planning a triple crown horseshoe? Or was he just climbing Nupse for the joy of it, because it was yet another mountain, yet another challenge, or because of some other reason, we'll never know. But given his triple ascent of the Eiger, the Munch, and the Jungfrau earlier in his career, I want to believe that his ambition was even more audacious than he let on. It would be typically Swiss and typically understated to go under promise and then over deliver and go do something even more amazing than what he had said he had initially wanted to do and let the climbing speak for itself. Once again, we'll never know, but it makes me a little bit happier and a little bit less sad about his death to imagine that this was his audacious goal. Goodbye, sir. You inspired and awed us, and there is no doubt that you lived the strenuous life.